Uh, good morning and thank you for joining us. COVID-19 is changing the way students are going back to school. It's gotten a lot more complicated. The pandemic is shaking up back to school shopping and most students will learn remotely for weeks, maybe the entire school year, while others will eventually return to classrooms. And when they do, they'll need the right tools for not only learning, but also staying healthy. So stocking up on supplies this school year goes beyond the traditional notebooks, pencils, pens, crayons, folders, things like that. And once again, Gaga 9 has partnered with the Salvation Army for this year's back to school drive. And we have information about that coming up. But this morning, we're gonna dive into what's needed this year and joining us are some educators. Um, we did have Lieutenant Stephanie Simmons scheduled. Uh, she was in the Salvation Army, but unfortunately she was sick today. So, but we have to really have these educators to help answer questions such as, should every student have their own set of school supplies? We have Kelsey Glavin, a teacher at Prince Elementary, and Andrea is a principal at Sunrise Drive Elementary. We're all friends here, so we're just going to go by first name. Uh, so let's first start with school supplies. Now, let's start at the principal level because um, that's where you know money comes in. How much? Supply, the individual school supply versus how much is there a reliance on the parents or the kinds of donating. So let's start with you, Andrea. Kind of walk us through um, just the entire school supply. Well, in the state of Arizona, schools are intended to supply students with the things that they need for learning. Um, with that, every year, our wonderful community here in Tucson does support our schools and our students by supplying donations. Sometimes that happens through the parent and the family, and sometimes it ha ha happens through an organization. As you noted, the Salvation Army is running a drive right now to collect school supplies to donate to students and schools. So um, lots of things are needed. Here at the elementary school, um, things that are really helpful for students are crayons, pencils, um, even uh, scissors and glue sticks. Uh, when markers and colored pencils are absolute treasures for a, a student to have. And those um, items are used in a variety of classes and courses. Even if you think about a student in um, elementary, middle, or high, they all need school supplies. Sometimes they change or are different depending on the level. Um, for example, at the high school, there are special courses. And so parents um, and community members can go to the website to find out what kind of donations are needed for the different courses and classes at the middle, high school, and the elementary levels. And Andre, you know, a lot of uh, school supplies sometimes in the classrooms are shared. This year it's going to be different because the CDC is also recommending that each student have their own individual supplies. Yeah. So that's added expense for the schools and I would imagine more donations are needed. Right. And what we love is for um, the way that the students are managing their school supplies to be totally efficient for the student. And so what I'm going to show you here um, would work in a school setting when um, it's safe for kids to return to the campus. They could use the same items or at home if, to organize whether they are in one special spot or maybe they have a couple special spots where they do their schoolwork or possibly a student is moving from um, their home to a relative's home like grandma or grandpa helping to care or between mom and dad's homes and so having a a plastic bag to hold the supplies is so nice for kids because it, it transports very easily. A little hand or a big hand can take that. But you can also use uh, different kinds of boxes to hold your school supplies. Um, and those will work at home as well as when students return to campus when it's safe. Okay, let's, uh, let's move to Kelsey now. Um, this is twofold now. First, I want you to talk about what is needed, what was needed in the uh, school, in, in the classrooms before COVID, 
And we'll, we'll talk about that first. And now after what you anticipate is going to happen. So just kind of walk us through a typical day, your third grade teacher, a typical day and how the supplies are used. A typical day at my elementary school is we have breakfast in the classroom. So before COVID and after we needed Lysol wipes, we need hand sanitizer because we're eating in our classroom. And then along with what Andrea said, we need a lot of those same things, the crayons, the pencils, all the school supplies to get us through the day to day. I think that the difference now is that we're gonna need twice the amount of supplies. We're gonna need double because we're sending home toolkits for the kids in those gallon Ziploc bags that she held up. And so that's a great donation that we'll be needing. But um, once we send home the glue sticks and the scissors and the highlighters and all that stuff, we're essentially saying goodbye to that stuff. And we're not guaranteeing it's coming back with the kids. So we're going to need an extra set of supplies for when they do return to the school. And then I was also thinking about since the kids aren't able to share now, I mean, we had blended learning in our classroom and the kids would be able to share headphones and computers and Luckily, I work for a district that is providing a lot of that stuff, but I think it'd be really helpful if we got like headphones for every single kid or earbuds because they're not going to be able to share it this year. So, and this is something that I think parents and students also need to understand as well. How fast did you get go through supplies from the start of the school year to the end of the school year? Because, you know, every everything starts fresh and you may have, I don't know if, whether you always needed this constant um, replenishing of supplies. Or did you, were they all stocked up at the beginning of the school year and then you just had to make it last through the rest of the school year? Um. I think I'm in a special situation. We're at a Title I school and we get a lot of stuff provided, but it does go pretty quickly. I mean, the kids are using it every single day and um, I, <laughs> they're using it every single day and they go through it quickly. They're very responsible. We're an avid school, so we teach them to be organized and use their pencil pouches, but we also have a big turnover rate. So with that, we're having to I think my school is 47% um, transiency. So we have um, kids that come in new and they need new supplies. And this year, especially when they come in new, they're going to need a brand new set that hasn't been used before. And as far as these certain supplies, what happens if you don't have enough? I mean, can you really get the lesson? I'm sure you improvise, but how important are these supplies? They're crucial, and if we don't have enough, I'm sure everybody's heard this, but teachers use their own money and they fund their classrooms. So if we don't have enough, then we go out and we get it and we make it happen because the success of our students is most important. So we're not gonna let them go without it. I'll get back to you, um, Andrea. I have a question for you too, but Kelsey, just this last question here uh, before we move on. Um, you know, we hear about a lot of teachers using their own money for supplies. And mm -hmm. like you just said, you got to just keep it going. You got to keep the learning going no matter what. Mm -hmm. Have you spent money? Have you each year? Have you spent a lot of money out of your own pocket? Um, every year I spend money on out of my own pocket just to make my classroom the best learning environment possible for the kids. But um, again, at Prince Elementary, we have Title I funding that gets us through a lot. And I feel really fortunate to work for a school and a principal who gets us pretty much everything that we need, but it, like you said earlier, it goes quickly and then we have to replenish it and we do, and especially like the hand sanitizer and the Lysol wipes and the things that aren't on a typical school list. Those are the things that we're going to target and we're paying a lot of money for. Andrea, um, let's move over to, you know, the need of these supplies. You have everybody, we've, we've reported on this, everybody pretty much knows this is common knowledge that teachers do buy their own supplies to get through the school year. So I would imagine that this particular year is going to be um, very challenging for some of these uh, teachers too, who are also concerned about their own health making sure that they have enough, there's enough hand sanitizers, there's enough of those supplies. Kind of speak to that a little bit. Absolutely. 
Um, our teachers are in our own district here in Catalina Foothills aren't returning until August 7th, but throughout the summer, uh, the administrators have been working with teacher teams um, and also um, in collaboration with Puma County Health Department. And we have um, secured um, face masks um, here at Sunrise Drive. We have an additional face shield for teachers. We have different types of face masks. For example, um, our younger students who are learning uh, phonics and before phonics establishing the phonemic awareness need to be able to see the mouth and the shape of the mouth when certain um, sounds are formed. And so we've ordered face masks for our teachers that have a clear shield. Also for students who uh, are have a hearing impairment, we want their teachers also to have a face mask that allows their uh, mouth to be seen. We have ordered um, portable hand washing stations here on this campus and across our district. We are working hard to make sure we have um, hand sanitizing uh, stations, sinks, as well as um, at the upper levels, there are a lot of hand sanitizing dispensers for the middle and high school students because they're traveling across campus um, more than an elementary student would be. And so um, although there's lots of sinks and soap and water around at our middle schools and high schools, we have added that just because of the type of day that the middle and high school students have. In addition, we've made some adjustments to all of our campuses. And when teachers do return, um, they'll see some of those changes, whether it's as simple as adding space and supervision for outdoor lunch or um, something more um, tangible like a uh, plexiglass guard um, in, in our highly um, traveled areas. So a lot of work has been happening over the summer. And when people return to the buildings, they will see all of those changes that are in place. I think one of the things that uh, will be, in a sense, the most shocking for students to see the amount of students, this is in the in-person, uh, when, that, when that happens, um, the in-person learning, is the amount of students who will be wearing these masks. Yeah. You know, Andrea, if you can, if you can um, answer this question about the masks. What do schools prefer? If somebody was going to donate, what do schools prefer? How much does everybody need? What do schools need? Um, donations uh, would be wonderful. We are requiring our students and our staff members to be wearing masks at all times. Over the summer, we have had a summer squad at the elementary levels. And then Valley View Early Learning Center has also had our early learners on campus. And we've been wearing masks this summer successfully with staff and students. Um, so I know as a principal, I've been collecting lots of um, masks to help distribute. But the school will also be um, supplying a paper mask a disposable mask if a child arrives without it. We are encouraging families to have a cloth mask for their student and also another one located in the backpack just in case I, something happens, I get it really wet or um, I, I'm going to eat my peanut butter and jelly sandwich and forget to take it off and now it's covered in peanut butter. So to have that extra one that's comfortable for the student. But if that happens, we will have an additional mask ready and any donation, whether they're disposable or cloth like this one, um, is would be happily received. Yeah, uh, let me go to um, Kelsey with the mask issue. Um, when you're dealing with any, you know, uh, third graders down to kindergartners, the challenge of keeping these masks on <laughs> and they're not like here or here or, you know, <laughs> anywhere else. So um, I, I know that, you know, it's an incredibly serious issue to make sure that these students are safe, but um, kind of walk through what's going on in your mind of having to deal now with this in the classroom. Well, I was just thinking if we're having, you know, five-year-olds who are in kindergarten wearing masks and 
um, if we asked for donations for masks, it would be wonderful if we could get the elastic ones that kind of tuck behind your ear because I have nephews and I know having them try to tie the ones behind their head, that was kind of a nightmare. So I can imagine with having six or 700 kids doing that all day long, um, it could be difficult. And then um, we actually, because I know Andrea mentioned that people have been working all summer long and we had the Quilters Guild they had an incredible idea of um, making masks that have the like sunglass band, the little tie, but it has clips on it. So when the kids are eating, they can kind of clip their masks on their shirts or just hang them down so that they don't lose them. Um, but having them wear them all day long, I think just like little ideas like that is going to be super helpful. So in your district, um, you are doing remote learning for how long before you know that, I know that it's it's um, tentative at this point uh, when certain districts, uh, the students return for um, in-school learning, but what is your district doing right now? Has a date been set? Our district is doing virtual learning until after Labor Day. That's what we know for sure right now. So as far as supplies are concerned, if somebody wants to donate now, for remote learning, what would you suggest? What Andrea suggested earlier with the crayons and the pencils and the glue, all of those supplies, because we know that we're going to have some kids that have trouble accessing the internet. So they're going to have to have an alternative so we can make it equitable for all of our students. So in order for that to happen, we need to send home um, toolkits and packets for them to work on. And I mean, our mission at Prince is to get our kids college and career ready. And in order to do that, we have to make their at-home experience as successful as possible. So just all the school supplies that we would start the year with, we're gonna need those same things to send home with them. So it's pretty, it's still fairly traditional um, as far as what people need to donate. Yeah, I right? love with all the cleaning supply, like the Lysol wipes and hand, sanitar hand sanitizer, that's going to be super helpful when we get back. And in Amphi, we're still going into the schools and teaching from our classrooms. So the teachers, I mean, the staff wants to stay healthy and safe, so we could use that stuff as well. Oh, that's a good point, too. Um, somebody also had told me that um, having things in these packets, like if you have a, a plastic bag, that you know, instead of buying the big giant, like, I don't know, 128 count crayons, that the smaller sizes are better. So for each individual student, because they're not sharing, is, is that a good recommendation? Yeah, I would say so. And when we do send some of that stuff home, I mean, we're hoping that parents are able to come and pick stuff up. But last year we were mailing stuff off. And so the smaller and more compact, I think will be more economical for our district as well. And do you actually deal with that yourself um, when all of these donations come in? Do you work with the school and just say, this is this is my class, this is what I need? Mm -hmm. And you, you do that? And yeah. when does that usually happen? Just throughout the school year, whenever the donations come in? Yeah, we have like a wish list that we put online and we give to our principal and we just try to get as much stuff as we can for that grade level. Okay, Andrea, just same questions too, as far as um, is it better than to have those smaller items so that they go out to each individual student? I do think we want it to be manageable. Um, and at the elementary level, we're dealing with five to 11 year olds. And so tiny little hands to, to much bigger hands. And so at home, I could have my school supplies in a plastic container that's not breakable. If I drop it, it's okay. I just pop everything back in. And then when it's time to go to campus um, and I have my in-person learning when Arizona is safe, then I just take my items and I dump them in the bag and I'm ready to go. So I, I do think um, the smaller items um, will work nicely for our students. And I want, um, I'm gonna go back to something that you asked Kelsey. As an administrator at a school, it, um, it's great to have donations. It's great that our parents uh, donate so much, um, as well as organizations like your work, Kids on Nine is working with the Salvation Army. But I, I do want to say that if a, a parent um, in this remote learning situation finds 
I am not um, able to do that, or I need the school. I expect the school to be providing those um, school supplies. We want to hear from you because we want to make sure your child has what they need. Kelsey has mentioned preparing some kits um, to support the remote learning, and that is something that we're going to be doing. And the kits um, could include uh, school supplies as needed, but also um, things like um, books for the kids to read. Um, we also, we want books to read for interest, um, but also we want to be able to provide textbooks for the reading level of the student. So that kit might include a specific uh, novel for, uh, for some work in English language arts. The kit also might include something for science that the student's gonna be using, for example, a plastic hand lens. Um, and so the idea for parents to have access to check out devices for students, but also for those hands-on material, it's important to us. And we want to connect with our families and we want to hear from families so that no student goes without. That's, that's the goal. And that's what this program is about, is supporting our community, supporting all students so that every learner can achieve what they should this year. It's going to be a beautiful year for the kids and we're all working together to make sure that happens well you know i think in some cases like i had homeschooled my uh, kids for a year um this was uh, probably about um, 10 years ago and so the distance learning programs the national ones that are out there um, it's interesting uh all of the dynamics that are involved with this and the fact that parents really have to stay top of everything, making sure that the kids get their work done. So it's a challenge for everyone. Unprecedented. Um, it's just, and, and education is a beast. I mean, there's so many parts to anything, whether it's, you know, in a particular classroom or an entire district. So any help that that anybody can give, and this includes, the, you know, the supplies, um, is greatly appreciated, and I guess even to a certain degree, an understanding of what's happening. Do you feel that? Let me ask you. Um, do you feel that parents uh, do understand kind of uh, what's happening and the shift because of the pandemic? Absolutely. I know the last quarter of the last school year, we obviously did distance learning. And I think that we were able to connect with our parents on a different level. And we were texting them and FaceTiming them and doing Google Classroom and Zoom. And just like being in the homes with the kids virtually, I think that that made the parents kind of understand the teacher's role, but it also made the teachers understand the parents' role. And it's really difficult to be a parent during this time and teaching your kids while their circumstances are changing too. I mean, they might be out of work and then they're seeing us kind of battle with the online curriculum. And it's just, I think, at least in my situation, I think that the parents and teachers worked really well together and understanding what was going on and that this is an unprecedented time that we're all working through together. And uh, uh, Andrea, I'll, I'll ask you that same question as well. I think um, pivoting is hard for us. Um, change is hard, yet we are resilient and we are responsive. So we do find ourselves um, as a community feeling stressed. Um, we're making hard decisions right now about our children and our families, about our jobs, and providing support to one another is important. As we move into remote learning, Valerie, it is going to be important for schools to be responsive to the social and emotional needs of our, our students. And every district is developing a distance learning plan um, that will be submitted to the state of Arizona. And a component of that is thinking about the social and emotional well-being of our students and how do we facilitate and foster um, those connections with students to support their social and emotional health. Um, and, and different schools will do that in different ways based on their community and their needs. Um, but it is important. And it's also part of our intentional planning as we work through this summit. 
I think making sure that kids have all of the resources, all the tools that they need so that they don't stress out. That's that emotional support as well. So I'm going to give some just some information. So if anybody wants to donate uh, to Salvation Army, um, this drive will go to mid-August. Supplies can be dropped off at any price or online cash donation can be made at salvationarmy.org. We have that information on the screen there as well. Um, supplies and backpacks will be handed out mid-August at a site to be announced. Um, at Salvation Army needs backpacks, pencils, pens, masks, hand sanitizers, and other types of supplies as we have discussed as well. So um, this is one of those years I think that if you never really thought about it, or, or maybe this is a year where you feel like you just want to help the education system in general, this might be the year for people to really step up. And whether it's a cash donation or they go out and get supplies themselves, um, I would think that this is this is the year, right, guys? We are so fortunate to be in a community that supports our students. I know here at Sunrise Drive, our local neighborhood uh, community, as well as our parent community, um, couldn't do more for our schools. They are there for our students and our teachers to support uh, student learning, um, preschool through grade 12. And I feel fortunate that when I look out at the Tucson uh, community as a whole, I see that that spirit uh, reaches far beyond and uh, students are important no matter which school they go to or where they live. I thank everyone for their support. Yeah, Kelsey, let's talk about at-risk students. And you said you have a high transient population. Mm -hmm. Anytime that you're dealing with technology and remote learning, um, that can't be stressful for them if they don't have the right tools. So what are you talking to? How are you talking to parents? How are you talking to students? I don't know if you, if you have that access to students yet, but as far as parents and letting them know that the school is there to get them the supplies that they need. Our district just bought, um, I don't know the exact number, I want to say 4,000 new Chromebooks. And I know our mayor is working to get hotspots put around town, in, especially in the 85705 zip code. And my principal and Susie Heilman kind of adopted our school and she's taken us under our wing and she's trying to get internet access in the daycares as well because a lot of our parents have to go to work. And so I think that that's one thing or a couple of things that we're doing to make sure that our kids can get Chromebooks, get access to internet, and then the teachers will be available as much as possible to try to navigate that with them and just be like on Zoom. And just, I know one of my teammates last year had to FaceTime and flip the camera and we were just talking them through, now click here, now click here. And I, it's kind of bizarre to say that that's the new norm for teaching is just walking them through that virtual learning, but trying to guarantee them as much success as possible. How much, and we've been talking about um, the amount of learning that happens in a particular year. If there's a drop off for one year, the kids can recover, especially things like math. Two years, that's very, very difficult. Sometimes they never catch up. It's, it's hard to do. So Kelsey, how are you going to be working through this? And I know the districts are doing that. I've spoken to the superintendents and they are doing a phenomenal job at making sure that there isn't much loss. Obviously you lose the hands-on learning, um, the way you experience them in the classroom. But what are you doing? How do you feel as a teacher today with the education level that you will be providing for the next school year? I feel like that's a hard question to answer because I, coming into this school year, I, the first days of school are all about getting to know your kids and the end of the school year was about like kind of assessing your kids and seeing how much growth they've made in a school year. And we didn't have that last year. So I'm gonna get this group of new third graders and I don't know where they ended last year. So I don't know where to begin this year. So I think that that's gonna be something that all teachers are going to have to figure out together is how can I see where my kids ended last year so that I know kind of where that drop off happened or where that gap is starting. Because we always see 
kind of like a little bit of regression in the summer because we have such a long summer. And, but now it's kind of like that regression or that gap is from mid-March to mid-August. So going into this school year, I really don't know how to answer that because I think all teachers are kind of going into this just using the resources and we are lucky and our superintendent has been super helpful with all of the online curriculum and the summer trainings that we have so i think we're just going to jump into google, google classroom and try to give our kids as much information as we can and the parents as much information as we can to kind of bridge that gap yeah communication is key and i know with um a transient population and the different languages and the cultural barriers i know that's going to be uh, difficult as well but let me ask you andrea um, how is the, from a practical perspective, how are you doing Well, there is a difference in um, what happened in March and the executive order at that time and the executive orders that are in place now. So in March, we were, it, it was like an emergency situation. The, we were absolutely reacting to the health of our community and trying to put into place very quickly remote learning, distance learning. We, although we had some time and we had some resources for professional learning, um, often teachers had never experienced delivering instruction this way. This, at this point, we are shifting or pivoting from a reactionary stance to more of a proactive stance. And so Kelsey mentioned that this summer she's been involved in professional learning for um, effective strategies to use with distance learning. And our teachers will, all of our teachers will be part of that. I think that it's important for us to plan. Um, we also uh, surveyed our community to find out what went well last spring and what need, what do we need to work on and improve on. And we looked at that information and took it to heart as we have been planning for the opening of school. So our goal is to maximize student learning and our, our efforts, our intentional efforts are committed to that. Um, we realized that we ended the year in a reactionary manner and our intention is to be proactive as we begin this year. 21st century skills, I know that the Catalina Foothills District um, has been at the forefront of bringing those skills um, and really owning that for the, for the district um, for at least more than a decade, um, what I understand. 21st century skills requires a lot of uh, communication, collaboration. Um, this is where, in a sense, that hands-on learning uh, component will kind of change things uh, this particular year. Andrea, I'm going to start with you and then I get back to um, Kelsey because I saw you and nod your head on that one. Um, let's just talk about that kind of like that collaborative effort and how it, are the districts going to be dealing with that? I think that you definitely are um, tapping into one of our challenges, but also one of our celebrations as we move forward. We want to, to be able to provide learning opportunities for students to develop communication, citizenship, uh, systems thinking, collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking. And so it is about honing our pedagogy, how we teach, how we plan, how we deliver instruction, how we assess that instruction, so that we are providing those rich experiences for students. So an example um, where that might be able to um, occur is possibly in a live interactive session so that the students have some background knowledge. They may uh, develop that through watching a video lesson of their teacher or accessing written materials. And then they can go into a live interactive um, session through the platform that the district chooses and they can interact with one another. And you can have those rich discussions um, in, in the platform. 
Also, one of the things that we learned, we I, I didn't know this, but the platform we use is Google Classroom and there's actual um, tools in Google Classroom where collaboration can occur in real time with students jotting down and adding to um, each one another's written work right there in the Google Classroom. So it can be done. We just have to, it's one of those pivots. We have to pivot and figure out how to do that and to match that uh, that teaching strategy, that instructional strategy to the learning um, goal that we are trying um, to help students achieve. So it will be done and we're working hard. Yeah, and Kelsey, you, you were nodding your head um, on this collaborative effort. So what do you say? Yeah. Andrea, that was very well said. I was going to say most of what you said, I think that uh, going along with the 21st century skills that you already mentioned, I mean, communication is huge and we teach our kids how to communicate and collaborate effectively in the classroom. And this is just, this is going to be a totally different way of communicating and collaborating. And we're going to have to teach them like online, then how to be like an online citizen and responsible online and come up with a whole new set of classroom rules. and. One of our um, 20th century skills that we focus on a lot is problem solving. And I think this is this whole first quarter is probably going to be a lot of real hands-on experience of problem solving, both for the teacher and the kids. Yeah, just dealing with the pandemic is a whole thing of problem solving. <laughs> and everything that you guys have gone through, you as a teacher are also then totally engaged in all of that. Um, as a teacher, though, do you think it's harder for the students to pivot or the teachers to pivot? I don't know how to answer that because I think there's just a whole different set of th things that they have to learn, like from the teacher's point of view, like we're stressing out learning Google Classroom and the online curriculum. and how to make sure that all of our kids have equitable access. But then on the student's point of view, I mean, some of them have never used Google Classroom before and they have to navigate that sometimes at home or at daycare. And I know when I was a student, I didn't know Google Classroom wasn't even a thing back then. So the parents are also having to navigate that. So I think there's just a whole different set of challenges depending on what end of it you're coming from. Okay, Andrea, same question though too, you know? I mean, as a principal and you're, and you're talking to the teachers, you're talking to the parents, who's, who's having a harder time pivoting? I think I look at this as a partnership because it's not about who uh, is struggling more or who has more feels, feels or perceives they have more obstacles. This is all about looking at the student, figuring out what do our students need to maximize their learning and what can we do to support that? And so reaching out to be partners with our families, partners with the community is so important because that will remind us to keep the students at the center, no matter what part of this is hard or challenging for us, we can remember that our work is for the students and to um, celebrate that our energy will help them grow. So I, I think it's more about not worrying so much about how hard it is or who's struggling more, but let's just all work together, join, in our, join our energies and join our efforts um, to make sure that the students have what they need. Give me some examples then. Let's let's stay on that topic of what then parents can do and what the community at large can do to truly help the schools. Is it more of the conversation? Is it more of the physical support of the items? Kind of talk about that. I personally think that um, I, I, my teachers and I, we want to hear from families. We want that interaction. So when remote learning starts, when we go back to school, and if a student is struggling with something or a family is struggling with something, we want to know what that is so that we can try to resolve whatever that issue is. What we don't want are for things to just continue to be hard for people. Uh, we want to work hard to uh, resolve any of the issues that are um, presenting. With that said, um, we 
also want to be providing um, what the families need. So this is a time when we are seeing food insecurity. Um, we're talking about school supplies today, but we have members of our community who benefit from donations of food. Um, so I think if community members are able to support the students in the Tucson community, uh, participating in the Salvation Army Back to School um, program is great, but also you could connect with your local school and find out what are the needs there in that building for, for that community of students. And Kelsey, when you're reaching out to parents um, right now, kind of how are you reassuring them that, yes, things are different, it's a challenge, but we're all good, we're all here to teach your kids and um, they are in this good learning environment. What are you telling them? Just what you said, we're all in this together. And a few parents have reached out to me and they are asking like, when is school gonna start or what do we need? And I think, just that open communication of, I don't know everything, I know what you know, and we're all just navigating this and figuring it out because this is a once in a lifetime huge event that's happening. And so I think that like Andrea said, she's so well-spoken, that we all are like a community. And if we just all tackle this together, then it, and the other thing I was going to say is when we're having conversations with our parents and with our community, just taking the precautions and wearing a mask out in public and doing what we can do so that we can all be back in the classroom sooner rather than later, because I know we all miss our kids and we just want them to be with us in the classroom. Let me ask you, um, is it easier to, and we're talking about the donations, there's cash donations and then there's the items themselves. Um, is it better for cash donations, the item themselves, because then you can choose what you actually need or does it really matter? Kelsey. I'll take what I can get. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever donations, cash donations are awesome. Um, other school supply donations are great, but as teachers, I mean, we can make use of just about anything. <laughs> Andrea, I'm going to ask you that same question too. <laughs> I, I do believe that um, if uh, the community would like to support this particular um, organization, the Salvation Army Back to School Drive, that it will serve the children, absolutely. Um, but it is the individual's prerogative, and if they feel that a financial donation to um, that organization or um, other resources in the community, like the Tucson Community Food Bank, or donating specifically to the school, that's up to the individual. But I guarantee whatever um, is donated will be greatly appreciated and used. So we're not going to be finicky about that in our community. Yeah, and it's a long year, a long school year. So if it's not used in the beginning, I'm sure by the end of the year. Is there any items that you feel that comes up every single year that people donate less of, but you find that you really do need that? Is Kelsey, let's start with you. Um, no, I think, I mean, always, I always have a surplus of tissues, I find, but probably not this year. Um, and then I think just, I'm pretty spread across the board. like. We need expo markers and we need glue sticks. Those are like the things that we use every single day that kind of dry out or kind of get too old to use. So I would say that those are the two that I'm always like running out of or in search of. Okay, and, and I'm gonna stick with you just for a second here, but um, with the remote learning for anybody who's just joining now, but for remote learning, what are the items that are needed um, and then as soon as the in-person, that's, uh, I think, a little bit more traditional. But if you can kind of explain the difference between the two of what's needed um, for remote and in-person. Um, I would say, like I mentioned before, the remote learning, we're going to need a lot of the same materials that we need for in-person learning just because we're going to be set and being a kit home with the kids. And then again, I think that earbuds would be really helpful for the kids because their parents might have them doing their remote learning on the computer, but parents might also be working from home. So that could be super beneficial. And they're going to need their own set when they come back to school. Okay, and, they, and we're not talking about expensive ones. Oh, um, um, 
They're at the dollar store and they work just fine. Okay. Uh, Andrew, the same question for you as well. You know, um, I don't think we see a difference in donations because the community responds to whatever list we put out. I would say that um, as a school, there is an item of a wish list that's convenient, um, but uh, it's not a necessity and I'll explain. We will be wiping our, when we return to school or for students who come to school um, um, under the governor's order, each school does need to provide um, support for students with distance learning. So we're going to 100% so, um, remote learning, but a parent, might need, a family might need for that student to um, go to the school or another place for safety during the day for to support their learning. So in that case, um, the devices will be wiped throughout the day. Um, and also things like the doorknobs and the, the table and everything else. And we're gonna have spray and we're gonna have towels, but I'm gonna tell you that something that is so convenient um, is, disinfecting wipes, you know, that would be a, a great thing to have. It's not that we don't have supplies for disinfecting, it's, it does come down to the convenience. So when you have lots of kids and lots of movement going on, um, the disinfecting wipe that's already has the cleaner on it is just really convenient to you. So I just stress, I'm now asking for a convenient, not a necessity, um, but I think any school would appreciate the convenient of a disinfecting wipe. We all will have the spray and towels and, and things to use, but that would be delightful to have. Okay, both of you are in elementary schools. So, um, Kelsey, I have this question for you as a third grade teacher. Um, you know, kids are wiping their hands and they sneeze. And how much do you really have to deal with this affecting in the course of a day? Um, and I don't know how many kids come to school kind of sick or, um, or you know, they can just get dirty uh, throughout the day. So if you can kind of explain that a little bit. Well, how much do I have to deal with that during the day? Is that your question? Just like yeah. going to change this year? Well, just what you normally deal with. And even with the in-person, I know that things are a little different with the social distancing, with the desks and stuff like that, but you're still dealing with the same kids. Yeah, well, and like during the day, we eat breakfast in the classroom. So it's like the spilling the milk and like everybody eating together and then we're wiping the tables. And so I don't know how that's gonna look when all the kids are wearing masks and going to lunch. And I think about like one of the biggest changes was going to be like recess and going to the cafeteria and what that's going to look like now, because I don't even, I don't know what I don't know. And so jumping into this, I think there's going to be a lot of changes, just like the day to day and walking in line. Do we have to be six feet apart walking in line? And I think that our, our old normal is kind of gone. And now we're going to have to shift to a new normal. And luckily, as a third grade teacher, my kids are pretty self-sufficient in cleaning up their messes and um, taking care of themselves. So I feel for all of the kindergarten teachers and the preschool yeah. teachers that are going to be doing this this year. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Kindergarten, first grade, that's going to be difficult. Andrea, you're in charge of them. <laughs> so uh, how do you deal with the different age groups? You know, it starts by thinking about the school as a whole system. Um, we have to have system-wide procedures and protocols. So we are successful as schools throughout the Tucson community. Um, schools are successful developing protocols, practices um, that support uh, the success of the whole organization. That's what we do. When you have hundreds of students coming on campus, you have to have procedures, protocols, processes for that. So in the past, uh, we have taught every student in the school the rules of the school. For example, what to do at lunch, how to be dismissed from lunch, playground rules, uh, how to play on different equipment, um, how to get on and off the bus. If you get parent pickup, what's the procedure there? What we're going to do is treat all of the new health practices that are going to keep us healthy and safe 
and we're going to teach them in the same manner. So we're gonna look at it as a whole school. Everyone's going to learn. We're going to have direct instruction about that. We know that it takes multiple opportunities to develop new habits and new behaviors. And so we're not going to just drop it after the first lesson of direct instruction. We're going to continue to spiral review. We're going to revisit and we're going to have constant feedback. We're going to be focusing on the positive feedback that we see, um, whether when the students return to campus and we see all um, of the students in front of us wearing their masks, we're going to take the three seconds and say, great job wearing your masks when you walked in the room today. Um, I noticed everyone washed their hands right when they walked into the room. Thank you so much for remembering to be safety. Safe. And so the importance of that direct instruction about the protocols and the practices for health and safety, but also the continual revisiting so that the, the brain has multiple opportunities. Human beings, we need feedback and we need positive feedback. And so we're going to approach this as we have approached the opening of school in other years. We are now adding new safe and healthy behaviors. Yeah, well, you know, you teach that also in health classes. So this is the real world classroom that you're dealing with. Um, and I think a lot of us uh, needed a few lessons with that. I'm going to go back to the uh, back to school drive, just some information if uh, anybody has just joined us or just a while ago. Um, this uh, uh, back to school program drive, and I'm uh, we'll go to mid-August. Supplies can be dropped off at any prize or online cash donations can be made at SalvationArmyTucson.org. You see that scrolling at the bottom of the screen. Supplies and backpacks will be handed out mid-August at a site to be announced. Salvation Army needs backpacks, pencils, pens, masks, hand sanitizers, and other typical supplies that we have discussed through this whole thing. Um, and disinfected wipes, you know, that type of thing. Uh, so this is a this is unprecedented, and, and we all know that. And I think as a community, uh, there is that feeling of togetherness that we're all in this together. And I think we're getting from that. There's a little um, fear from teachers going back into the classroom. Did hear about that, very legitimate fears on, on what's going on in the districts um, have been handling that in this very fluid situation. I mean, sometimes it changes daily, uh, weekly, and you really still can't project out even like two or three months. So I'm gonna start with you, Andrea. Um, just talking about just kind of your feeling as a principal and um, as we wrap up uh, this webinar, but your feeling as a principal overall of, and you've discussed a lot of this before, um, but kind of tell me what is needed from the community, um, not only with the supplies, this particular back to school drive, um, but what is, what is needed, let's get past the uh, parents, what is really needed for the community right now? Um, I would say as a community, um, a real big picture idea is let's become healthier as a community. So um, our leaders have asked us for specific behaviors to help us get healthier. One is um, home is safer. So instead of being out and about in large crowds, um, try to think about that. Um, social distancing, let's, let's help reduce the risk that's happening now so we can all work on social distancing. Um, exercising outside, um, enjoying uh, the, the beautiful Tucson region that we, we live in um, by exploring the outside for exercise. And, and wearing a mask when in public, um, being prepared to return to school with your mask on um, and being prepared for all the healthy habits. Lots of hand washing. Um, we are going to be asking children not to play tag. We're gonna have different games at recess. So re uh, reducing our physical touch 
to elimination, just not doing it. Um, and so as a community, just working on those healthy habits are helpful. Um, our own school community couldn't be more supportive of our schools and, I, and um, of our students. And because of the support of our students, they support our teachers. So we thank um, the Tucson community and the, the Sunrise Drive and Cali Foothill School District uh, community for supporting our teachers and our, and more importantly, supporting our students. All right, last question for you, um, Kelsey. I'm just gonna give you the microphone here and, and um, just some last words on, you know, what you guys are, are dealing with, but also how the community can help, especially with this uh, back to school drive. Well, like Andrea said, Tucson is a beautiful, wonderful community. And I feel that teachers have been so supported by everybody with their patience and all this new learning. Um, I would just ask that parents, and I'm sure that this is already happening, but are having conversation with their children about the new expectations and about how school is going to look different. And when we come back, it's not gonna be school per usual. It's going to be a whole different way of all kinds of different procedures. Like Andrea said, you know, recess and there's not gonna be tag anymore. And just having those conversations with kids so that when they do come back to school, they kind of know what they're in for. Andrea, I'm just ask you your last thoughts as well. I'm excited um, for us to start the new school year. I realize that um, going with 100% remote is very different than what many of us um, had thought months ago. Um, with that said, we have students at the center and we are going to have a wonderful year. We look forward to serving every one of our students and ha happily helping them on their journey as they grow and learn. That's important to us and that's why we're here. All right, thank well, thank you for joining us today, um, providing all this information, especially about the supplies. Again, if anybody wants to uh, donate, SalvationArmyTucson.org, uh, back to school. Uh, you can cash donations. You can also leave um, items at fry stores as well. So please donate as much as you can because this is one of those years that with individualized packets going out to students, whether it's remote learning or in the classroom, I think a little extra is probably going to be needed. So thank you both for joining us and um, have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.